As we do that this morning, I want to ask you guys a question that relates to this text and relates to the topic this morning. But when you guys think about your Christian life, what are some, if you could give me like a top five most important aspects of growth and maturity in the Christian life, what would some of those things be for you? What are some of the number one things you would need in your life to be able to grow and mature as a Christian? And you can actually answer this. Okay, prayer. Yes, I have that down. Prayer. Say that one more time. Okay. Yep. Don't steal my thunder. Knowledge of the word. Yeah, amen. Okay, what else? Is that it for the Christian life? Prayer and some word? <laughs> yes, okay. I would say yes. So intimacy, communion with God, fellowship with the saints. What about what we're doing this morning? Yes. Corporate worship. The gathering of the saints together. So, yes, you guys kind of answered all the ones that I had down. And so I, usually I was, I was thinking you'd, we'd miss this one. But yes, all those things are important, right? And there's more. But if you could list the essentials. Those would all be, in my opinion, essentials of what it, what, of what, not just what you would want, but actually what you need in the Christian life if you're going to see any kind of growth and maturity. So what I want to talk about this morning is one of those central things that the Bible says is important for your Christian life, for your Christian growth, for your Christian maturity, rather than ultimately that you would remain faithful to the end. And that's this, it would be Christian doctrine. Now, one of the things the Bible holds out for us as Christians that is essential to living as a Christian and remaining as a Christian is doctrine. And the Bible is concerned about this because as Christians, the Bible wants us to grow and mature in our understanding of doctrine, which would be to grow in our understanding and knowledge of what the Bible teaches on any given subject as it's presented to us in the Word of God. And not only that, that we would know it, brethren, but that we'd also be able to understand and teach and defend the essential truths and doctrines of the Christian faith. This is an essential element of what you need as a Christian to grow in your faith and maturity. So this is what I want to discuss this morning and hopefully stir you up here. I want to discuss the importance of doctrine in the Christian life. And I get it. This is probably no new concept for anybody in this room. But I, I simply, brethren, this morning, I was stirred up by this word as I was reading through the scriptures this week. I want to stir you up once again to be reminded of just how important doctrine is for your Christian life. How essential it is. How necessary it is. Brethren, that the teachings of Scripture play a singular and fundamental role in your growth and sustenance in the Christian life. That your ability to persevere, your ability to run well, your ability to remain faithful till the end of your life will in part hang upon you knowing Christian doctrine. And so as we look into this topic, I want to jump off those last two verses of the text here in 1 Timothy 4, because it's going to kind of springboard us into our main points this morning. So let me read it again, those last couple verses. If you want to look there with me, if you had it open in your Bible, 1 Timothy 4, I'm going to begin there at 15, just read these two verses and then give us some of our points this morning so that we can understand the importance of doctrine in the Christian life. So here again, what Paul says. Notice what he says to Timothy here. Practice these things, which Timothy, right before this, he told him was the teaching in your life. Doctrine and Christian living. He says, practice these things. I love this phrase. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching, persist in this. For by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. 
So brethren, why is Christian doctrine important to the Christian life? Well, I want to draw that out this morning with three points based upon those two verses. One, I want to make the point that doctrine is necessary for growth and maturity, right? Doctrine is a necessity to know and to learn and to grow in in order to mature in the Christian life. So that'll be our first point. Doctrine is necessary for growth and maturity. The second is going to be that doctrine must be guarded and protected. That the doctrine that helps you grow and mature in the Christian life is also the same doctrine that needs to be guarded and protected in the Christian life. And lastly, that doctrine is vital to keep you as a Christian in the faith. That at the end of the day, sound biblical doctrine produces a result and that it's you remain. Or as he says there at the end of 16, that you would save both yourself and your hearers. So those will be our three points to, to, to talk about why is doctrine so important in the Christian life. So before we do this, I, I want to give two kind of prerequisites here at the beginning. This is more for you guys to think about as, as, we, as we jump in to uh, this idea of doctrine in the Christian life. And the first one is going to be this. What do I mean by doctrine? Because I don't think it's always so safe to assume what that word means. And so let me give just my kind of brief overview definition. What I intend by the word doctrine this morning is how we typically think of we collect and, and summarize as Christians the truth that we find in the Scriptures. So as we pour through the Bible from the Old and New Testament, we take all that the Bible has to say about a particular topic or subject, and we put all of those verses together, and we begin to summarize what they teach. I mean, we kind of did this on Friday. We had a good old shale conversation. Brother, you, you would have loved it. It was a good conversation. But, but in essence, what we did there on Friday is what we were doing. We were, we were practicing doctrine. We were summarizing a collection of Christian truths as found in the Scripture to come to a particular doctrinal conclusion about a matter in the Scriptures. And so that means then, brethren, that doctrine is the result of this gathering together, of this work of the Scriptures uh, about what it says about particular things. And, 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 and the Bible does this as well, right? The Bible will take truths in it, and it'll collect these truths and give kind of foundational summaries of these truths in Scripture to where we get what you could call a doctrinal statement in Scripture. You guys think of something like Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Paul gives there what you could call a doctrinal statement. He speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ, and he speaks about key important things that Christ did, and he summarizes them in one concise summary statement. And so, brethren, when, when, when we do this kind of thing, um, and when we see it in Scripture, what, what is being offered to us in the Bible is a body or collection of teaching that we end up calling doctrine, which is fundamental for you as a Christian to believe and to practice. And so this is what I mean by doctrine here this morning. These summaries of truths that we find in the Bible that come to us in these concise summary statements that you are called upon to believe as they are revealed here in the Scriptures. And so there's that. Second would be this. As we think then about these truths, we think about this doctrine it is key, brethren, this is absolutely key if any of this conversation this morning is going to matter. It is key that we believe and confess together as a people that the Scriptures, the Bible that you hold in your hands, from which we get our doctrine from, is derived and comes from God Himself. Right, that, that if we're going to say doctrine's important to the Christian life, that we, the reason we'd be able to say it's important is not because it's Manny's doctrine, or it's Nick's doctrine, or it's Aaron's doctrine, or it's Redeemer's doctrine, but brethren, that we could say it comes from God Himself. 
This is a vital Christian belief to hold as we think about doctrine. And the word that we often use as it relates to this is the word inspiration, right? The idea that the Bible, even though we recognize the Bible's written by human authors, it comes to us through human authors, that regardless of it being written by human authors, the words that get recorded are still the direct words of God Himself. And therefore, we can look to the Bible and say, there is no taint or there is no distortion of God's Word as it is recorded here in Scriptures. So that when you pick up your Bible, you can know, I have a word from God. And this is what is meant by that term, then, inspiration. And this is an important factor for us to believe. Because Scripture itself makes this an important factor to believe. Think of a text like 2 Timothy 3.16. What does it say in 2 Timothy 3.16 in regards to Scripture? Well, it says all Scripture is what? Yeah, breathed out by God. Meaning... And it, that's where we get the, the term inspiration from. But it literally, it's meaning it's exhaled by God. It comes from God's very mouth. And so the Scriptures themselves view the Bible this way. That as you look in the Old and New Testaments, what you're not getting is men's collection of truth. You are getting God's collection of truth. You are getting God's Word Himself. Because all Scripture, the entirety of the Bible, is breathed out and inspired by God. So brethren, this means that as we pick up the Bible this morning and we ask why doctrine is important, you can say it's important because we're picking up God's own Word. And that's weighty. You're picking up and hearing the very words of God this morning. And so as the Bible begins to sum up its own message then, and it begins to give us doctrinal truths that we need to believe, we need to recognize it is giving us nothing less than God's own summary of His own truth. That as you read and get doctrine from the Bible, this is not man's interpretation of God's words. This is God's own interpretation of His own words. This is what God wants you to believe because it comes directly from Him. And I think these are necessary things for us to believe at the outset and to understand at the outset. Otherwise, nothing else is really important in this conversation. So, let's dive through these three points, and our first point being this. Doctrine is necessary for growth and maturity. So I think the Bible lays out that doctrine plays what I would call a positive and necessary role in the Christian life. So you think about Jesus' own commission, right, to His disciples. I think He makes this kind of point abundantly Clear. So in Matthew 28, when we get the Great Commission, hear what Jesus says here in the Great Commission about the Christian life or discipleship. What does he say? And Jesus says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And in the right here is key. What is at the heart of this discipleship, this great commission that Jesus has a plan for to receive people from all the nations? Well, He says it right there, teaching them. Jesus says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So, we could say this. According to Jesus, doctrine, the Scriptures, truth, plays a necessary and vital role in a Christian's growth and maturity. Why? You can't be a disciple without teaching. You can't grow as a disciple without doctrine. According to Jesus... The learning of all that He has said and commanded is a foundational mark of discipleship. In order to be a faithful disciple, then one has to come to know and grow in their understanding of what Jesus has said and what Jesus has taught. Brethren, that means that doctrine has to be learned. 
It's not an option. It's necessary for you to grow and mature as a disciple. This is what a faithful disciple does. Brethren, they learn all that Jesus has commanded and taught. They are to learn everything that the Bible would have to say is required for us to believe and live rightly in this world. And in order to do that, brethren, you have to be taught doctrine and you have to learn doctrine. You need to learn what the Bible has said on a given topic or subject subject, so that you would be a well-rounded and well-matured disciple. And Paul also affirms this very thing too, right? He states there in 2 Timothy 3.16 that teaching and doctrine of the Scriptures are a necessity if one is to also be equipped for good works and obedience in the Christian life. So we go back to 2 Timothy 3.16 And everyone quotes 2 Timothy 3.16, but they often leave out 2 Timothy 3.17. And so here's what it says in context. Here's what Paul says. It says, all Scripture, right, breathed out by God, inspired by Him, comes from God directly, and is profitable for teaching and for reproof and for correction and for what? Yes, for training in righteousness for this purpose, that the man of God may be complete, mature, perfect, and equipped for every good work. So brethren, I think the Bible is abundantly clear here that doctrine and the teaching of Scripture play a positive role in the Christian life, and not just a positive one, brethren. It is essential it is foundational, it is fundamental to what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that is, we come to know and grow and mature in our doctrine because it matures us into the image of Jesus Christ. So brethren, learning and growing in doctrine is fundamental for you in what it means to be a disciple. Disciples are marked out by this kind of thing. They are those who grow in this kind of thing. They are those who grow in it, not just for the sake of knowing things, but also growing in godliness and good works. Which also means then this for us this morning. It means that doctrine, brethren, listen, this is important. Doctrine is not just something for you to acknowledge intellectually this morning. Because everybody can do that. And everybody does do that to some degree. Rather, brethren, doctrine is instructive for you, for your life in godliness. For you to grow and mature as a Christian is not just to intake information, but it's to allow that doctrine to shape and to mold you into something so that doctrine then begins to inform how you live. So that right living flows out of right belief. I believe this, therefore I do this. And brethren, this is the positive role that the Bible lays out for doctrine as as its primary importance in the Christian life. It is absolutely necessary. But a second point to this, of doctrine being a necessity for growth and maturity is, where does that work itself out then? Right? Because that's like, okay, great. That truth is really great. But where does that truth work itself out in? How can I, as a Christian, then say, okay, I believe that. Now, what do I do to be able to grow in, in, in maturity and, 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 and grow in my understanding of doctrine? And Paul tells us where this happens too. Now, this isn't the only answer, but I'll say this is the primary answer. Brethren, the Bible says that it's in the church. It's the church where this growth and maturity in Christian doctrine takes place. Now, Paul tells the Ephesians this when we were going through Ephesians, not, you know, not just a few months ago in this section, Paul tells the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 4 that one of the essential reasons God created the church and gave gifts to the church was that God would equip the church with pastors and teachers for the purpose of building up the body in maturity in doctrine. Here's what Paul says here in Ephesians 4. Remember this. And he gave apostles, the prophets, 
the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to do what? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so so for what purpose? So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So Paul is making a very clear point. Where does this growth and maturity primarily take place? It takes place within the church where God has planned that through the instruction and the teaching from pastors and teachers that you would grow up into doctrinal maturity. Why? So that you don't get carried about by every wind and wave of doctrine that floats your way. There is going to be a result that happens for the Christian within the church as they are under the teaching and under the doctrine, and that is they will grow up into maturity so that they don't wander off into error. And you could imagine why Paul would say, this is where this growth and maturity primarily takes place. And you can imagine why, brethren. How many? Let me ask you this question. How many false beliefs and false religions are out there in the world right now? How many? Too many to count. And how many of you used to be stuck in them before you came to know Christ? All of us. You all believed something in air. You all had false beliefs. We all had false doctrines. And Paul is concerned about this for the Christian. He knows how vital doctrine is for growth and maturity. And he knows how vital then the church is and its leaders and its teaching to keep the Christian well grounded in sound doctrine. This is the place that, that, that Paul and therefore God has in mind for you to grow and mature in doctrine. It's here within the church. Because brethren, if not, those who don't mature in this kind of thing, who don't grow in this kind of thing, are going to be like that person that Paul is warning about. They're not mature or well-grounded in Christian doctrine. And then what happens to them? Well, they're like the water that the wind blows around. They are so easily tossed around like waves on the sea, brethren, which in turn produces no stability in your Christian life and can cause you to wander off into air. And so, brethren, doctrine is absolutely, from the Bible's own uh, view of this, is so vital and foundational to grow and mature in the Christian life. And the place where that happens is right here in the church. Don't forsake that kind of thing. Doctrine is important for you to grow and mature in the Christian life. And it happens right here with the people that you're sitting around. And brethren, it's a sad reality when that kind of thing doesn't happen. I mean, have we not seen that within our own midst since the time we've been a church? People who don't give themselves to the fellowship of the saints and to its doctrines and to its teachings. And then what happens to them, brethren? They do get carried around. They get tossed about like the water on the sea. They do end up wandering off. Brethren, these people stand as examples for us. And you may, you may know of some people in your own life, whether you know someone in this church or not. But brethren, I want you to think about them this morning. So that you would recognize, yes, doctrine is so important for me to grow and to mature and to remain. And I want you to think of these kind of examples of people. Because brethren, listen, you think about them. You think about some of the characteristics of their life and of their mind and of their heart. They cared very little for growing in doctrine. They cared very little for trying to understand the Bible. They cared very little about the fellowship. They were never somebody who you would say, man, that person is grounded and well-established in their faith. They seem to be people that when things happen in their life, they're just so easily undone and moved by every opinion that comes across their way. And they're, brethren, therefore, they're, they're not able to filter out bad and, and to keep the good because everything blows them and moves them. And then you look at their life and you look at their actions and they display to you 
that person doesn't really know God that well. And brethren, it's because they did not give themselves to this truth. Doctrine is necessary for you to grow and mature in the Christian life. And don't forsake the place where God has its role to play, the church. Paul says this should not be the case. We are to grow up into maturity so that this doesn't happen. And so, brethren, we are to mature in our doctrine through the teaching and equipping of the church because it's important. So second then, if doctrine is this fundamental to our belief and practice as Christians, if it's this fundamental for us to grow and to mature in the faith, then I would say the second point is then this. Doctrine must be guarded and protected. we got to be concerned with guarding our doctrine both personally and corporately as a church. You think of what, Tim, or excuse me, what Paul says there to Timothy again in 1 Timothy 4.16. Keep a close watch on who? On yourself and on the teaching. Or you could understand that as the doctrine, the body of beliefs that we have as Christians. And the question becomes, why? Well, because of this, brethren, bad doctrine has bad consequences for everyone involved. And so here, I think, are some ways then the Bible calls us to guard our doctrine. First is going to be this. First, brethren, we need to believe what the Scriptures say, and then we need to live according to what those Scriptures say. Hear me on that? First is, you want to protect doctrine? You want to protect yourself in the doctrine of the church? Or brethren, you need to first then believe what the scriptures say. You need to believe that doctrine and then you need to live your life according to that doctrine. Listen how Paul says this in 2 Timothy. This was, this was the uh, New Testament reading that Giovanni read. Listen to this. 2 Timothy 1 at verse 13. Follow. Hear that. Follow the pattern of sound words. That's an interesting phrase. Follow sound. How do you follow sound words? Well, I think that's both hearing, believing, and then living out those words. Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted in you. And so I think Paul has here in mind how you guard doctrine. How do you guard this great in guard? How do you guard this great deposit of the faith, this great doctrine, this great belief that we have that God has given to us in His Word? Well, brethren, follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard. And so I think the way you can do this is twofold. How do you follow the pattern of sound words? And in doing so, guard the deposit that's entrusted to you in the Word. Well, I think there's two aspects to this, to guarding the faith and following sound words. The first is that you remain faithful. Hear me out on this. The first one is you remain faithful to the content of what is taught. You need to remain faithful to the doctrine as it comes to you and is taught in the Bible. Paul says this to Titus that relates to the content of the doctrine he has been taught. Here's what he tells Titus in Titus 1. He must hold firm, right? He, 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 must, he, he must be faithful to the content, right? He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught from the Scripture so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So for Paul, the way that we can guard our doctrine is that we hold firm to the doctrine as trustworthy as it's been taught from the Scriptures. So that when you open up the Bible, and the Bible teaches a doctrine to you, that you stand firm on what the Bible teaches and not on the whims of somebody else or yourself. 
For Paul, the way that you guard doctrine is that you hold firm to what is taught and you don't waver from it, even when there's temptation to waver from it. That you don't waver from the truth of Scripture. Brethren, that we would accept as we open up the Bible and receive the Word and receive doctrine, that we would accept all the Bible says about any given thing and that we would not waver from what it says. The temptation here is this. The temptation is that we would take the doctrine taught to us and distort it or reject it. Which is why he says, hold firm to it. Follow the pattern of sound words as you have been taught. Because the temptation, brethren, is to hear those words as it's taught and then distort those words as it's taught and to reject what you were taught. That's the temptation. Brethren, Paul tells us we must guard this great deposit as we have received it, as it has been taught to us. And we do this, brethren, by being somewhat passive in this. We don't invent the doctrine. We don't come up with the doctrine on our own. Brethren, we do this by receiving and then holding on to the doctrine as it comes to us in the Bible. That is how you begin to guard yourself and the doctrine or the teaching in the Scriptures. You receive and hold firm to the teaching and the doctrine, how the Bible lays it out. You remain faithful to the content of what is taught and you don't waver from it. But the second way, brethren, the second way that you follow sound words and protect yourself in the teaching to guard it is that you live faithfully in light of that teaching. You live faithfully in light of the teaching. And and Paul goes on to demonstrate this later in Titus. I I want to turn here. You can turn there too. Titus 2. Titus chapter 2. Paul demonstrates this very reality here in Titus chapter 2. That the other way, the, the, the second way that you guard yourself and your doctrine and follow in sound words is that you live faithfully in light of the teaching that you have received. Paul tells Titus here at the beginning in verse 1. He says, But as for you, teach what accords. Does anyone know what a accord means? It just means to agree. We don't ever say that. I accord with that. No, I just say I agree with that. That's what he's saying. As for you, now listen to what he's telling him to teach. A teach what agrees with sound doctrine. Okay, so there is something that should be taught in practice that agrees with the sound doctrine of the Word. That from sound doctrine will flow something else. And Paul demonstrates that here by saying sound doctrine is to be guarded and kept by living out faithfully from that doctrine. Because what immediately follows Titus's, or excuse me, Paul's command to Titus here. He says, but as for you, teach what agrees with sound doctrine. And then what does he begin to do? Well, he teaches how you ought to live properly in accordance to that sound doctrine, older women do this. Younger women do this. Older men do this. Younger men do this. Bond servants do this. And Paul is trying to say, you need, in order to guard yourself and the doctrine, you have to then also live properly in light of that sound doctrine that you have received. And because, brethren, these two things are always come intertwined together. This is all because some, as the Bible makes clear, will seek to both live differently than how they were taught, and will also seek to accumulate false teaching that contradicts the word that they've been taught. They will seek to live differently than the doctrine that they've been told. And they'll also seek to gather false doctrine that contradicts the original doctrine that they've been taught. So what Paul tells Timothy 
earlier in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, for the time is coming when people will not endure what? Sound teaching, sound doctrine. Why? But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Brethren, that's because the temptation for all who hear sound doctrine and come to know the truth, the temptation is that you would distort it and walk away from it and live contrary to it. Rather than remaining in accordance with sound doctrine, one would be tempted by passions and evil desires to gather towards yourself false doctrine so that you could affirm a wrong way of living and justify an ungodly way of living. And brethren, listen, this is a temptation that can and will come your way. This is not just for a few select Christians. This temptation will come your way. It'll try to get you to twist the Scriptures as you have been taught so that you would accumulate false doctrine and then justify ungodly living in your life. This is a real temptation for the people of God, even a temptation for you now, this reality. So brethren, this is why you have to be on guard as it comes to yourself and your doctrine, because you have to remain faithful to the Word as you received it, and then remain faithful in living in accordance with that truth. You must guard your doctrine. So brethren, you have to do that by agreeing with what you've heard and then living consistently with what you've heard. But another way that we guard doctrine, brethren, is this. And this one is a little bit external to us. We guard and maintain our doctrine by fighting and contending for the faith from false teachers. Jude exhorts us in this kind of thing. He says, Beloved, this is Jude verse 3, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend or fight for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Well, the question would be, why? Why did you find it necessary, Jude, to write to the church to say, fight for the faith? Well, verse 4. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who what? Pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master in Lord Jesus Christ. Is that not the very thing that we got in our first point? What do false teachers want to come in and to do? They want to pervert the doctrine so that it would lead you, brethren, into sensuality and ungodly living. And this is why the second point is so important. We must contend and guard the faith by fighting against false teaching and false teachers. This is a perennial issue in the church when you go through your New Testament. <laughs> And I think everyone would agree now, it's still a perennial issue in the church now. You go read Peter, you go read Paul, you go read John, you go read Jude. You read any letter in the New Testament, except I don't, I'm, there might be one that maybe doesn't go crazy on it, but almost all of them, brethren, go read any of them, and all will speak of false teachers and false doctrine trying to creep itself into the church. If you think about when uh, Manny was going through the end there in Ephesians, Paul will speak of beasts that he fought in Ephesus, false teachers. And you think about how Paul even leaves the Ephesian elders in Acts 20. When he leaves them, what, what is part of his departing cry to him? He warns them, wolves will come in among you to devour the sheep, even taking some of you and leading them off. Astray. He warns them, brethren, as he's about to leave. 
False teachers are coming. False teaching is coming. It comes in, brethren, to destroy the church and to draw people away. And you notice where that false teaching arises. It arises within the church. Brethren, notice where false teaching in Scripture arises from. Almost always, the warning is, it will come from among you. It'll come from people among you. Either people who creep in and they appear to be brothers, or it could even come from people in this room. This is where they come from. And so, brethren, it goes back to our first point even more. Why should you guard yourself in doctrine and not depart from the teaching and live in light of it? Because, brethren, if not, false teaching could come from within our own midst among people we call brother. It can come from within. But then how, does, how, how, are we, how often do we address the false teaching and the false teachers? Well, I'm not going to say everything that can be said about this, but I'm going to make one point that is clear in all of these texts. Paul is going to tell us, here's how you guard against uh, here's how you guard the doctrine by fighting false teachers. Here's what you have to do. False teaching must be corrected by rebuking the false teaching or false teacher. Paul tells Titus in a number of places, one in Titus 1.9 and Titus 2.13, he tells him multiple times that he is to rebuke false doctrine and those who teach it. That if anyone would come in and contradict sound words, sound doctrine, he says you are to rebuke it, and even he says rebuke it sharply. And you can imagine why now, the reason for that. Brethren, such a serious and such a sharp rebuke is necessary as it relates to false doctrine and false teaching because of what it can do. People will wander away from the truth. And this, brethren, can greatly damage and defect the very people sitting in this room or any Christian in any church. Paul tells this, uh, says this to Titus. This was happening in their day. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced. Why? Since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Brethren, false doctrine and false teachers always produce nothing but sorrow and misery in their wake. And so they must be silenced. So then, brethren, we have a duty then as Christians to not just be on guard for our own lives and for our own doctrine. But brother, we have a duty as a church together and as individuals to guard against false teaching and false teachers in our own midst. And we have a duty, brethren, to correct it so that we would guard the deposit entrusted to us. Because brethren, if not... If we don't do this, if we say, I don't want to do that, I don't want to have to make correction, I don't want to have to receive rebuke or give rebuke, brethren, the, the other option is if we don't correct the falsehood and we leave bad doctrine alone, then sound doctrine and teaching will be distorted and abused and it will lead to those Christians wandering away who get pulled in by it. And so you have to think to yourself, if doctrine is so important for my growth and my maturity, then we got to be on guard for this thing. Because, because what, is the, what is the opposite effect? Well, bad doctrine, brethren. Bad doctrine will produce the opposite effect. It will lead to people's destruction. So we must be on guard, brethren. Not only is doctrine important for our growth and maturity, this is why we have to guard and protect it. Well, lastly, brethren, is doctrine then is vital for us as Christians to remain in the faith. Maintaining and growing in sound doctrine, as Paul is going to say here at the end of, uh, of the text here in 1 Timothy 4, produces a result in one's life. If one grows in doctrine, 
And if one keeps themselves and their doctrine unstained, and, and they guard and protect against it, well, he's going to say that it produces this result here at the end. He says there in 16 at the close, persistentness. For by doing so, you will what? You will save both yourself and your hearers. And so the result then that comes from this is that Christians would remain in the faith and would not fall away. Because here's the reality. In Paul's day, some had. This is something that had already begun to happen. This, this is something that had happened in Paul's day. He gives examples of this. You guys remember the example of Hymenaeus and Alexander? What happens to them? What is it said about them that they do because they rejected sound doctrine and they rejected living in light of it? What happens to Hymenaeus and Alexander? What does the Bible say they do with their faith? They make shipwreck. Hear this. This is what Paul says about them in here. This is 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in 18. That's what Paul says happens to them because they didn't do this. He says, This I charge, or excuse me, this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously, excuse me, prophecies previously made about you that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith in a good conscience. Here's what he says about these men. By rejecting this, faith in a good conscience, they rejected it. They turned away from the sound words and they did not follow the pattern of sound words. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Brethren, this is the reality that can happen. If we don't hold to sound doctrine faithfully and practice in belief, it's not a question of if or uh, maybe. Brethren, it's just a question of when. You will shipwreck your faith. If you do not hold to sound doctrine in practice and belief, you will make shipwreck of the faith. What a sobering reality that is. Brethren, if we're not careful to do what Paul tells us to do, to immerse ourselves, as he says, to immerse ourselves in doctrine and godliness, and we don't persist in these things, the, the result will be, you will shipwreck the faith. You will fall away. You will walk away from the Lord. This can and has happened. So brethren, which is why if we're going to immerse ourselves and persist in sound doctrine, our doctrine can't be unrelated to our lives and our living. Paul's central concern in this entire discussion of doctrine and its importance in the Christian life never once gets separated from your practical living. Paul is concerned with sound teaching and doctrine because it watches not only what you believe, but it watches over what you do. It watches over your very life. You can't have one without the other. And listen, brethren, a Christian, a Christian may have a godly life on the surface, yet without the foundation of sound doctrine, they will ultimately fail to make it in the end. And you got to believe that. Because, if you, if, because brethren, if, if you don't, you'll think you're on a firm foundation and come to find out that you're not. That all of your Christian living wasn't built upon the found, firm foundation of the Word. And that when trials and temptations and things come your way, instead of remaining upon the rock of the Word, you get blown away. And you get removed. And you wander off. Because the wind comes and it takes you up. And so, brethren, with no foundation to fall back on, when these things happen, the Christian godly life that appears on the surface will mean nothing. Whether it's a show or not, it won't mean anything without the foundation. But it also means this, brethren. It also means in the same way that someone 
may have all of their doctrinal cues lined up. They may have their doctrinal checklist pulled out. And they may check every single doctrinal box as it relates to the teaching of the Bible. But if that one or person lacks in godliness and obedience, Jesus says that their doctrine will damn them in the end. That they will be no better than the person who appeared to live a godly life but had no foundation. They'll be no better than them. They may to appear to have the doctrinal foundation, but if their life does not accord with their doctrine, Jesus says they'll be damned forever. Matthew 7, 22. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Brethren, God will not care on the last day if you can pass a doctrinal test mentally, but you were void of godliness your whole life. You were, vo you were void of obedience to the Scriptures. Sound doctrine, brethren, will always, if it is sound doctrine, will always produce sound living. If somebody lacks godliness and faithful Christian uh, living, then their theology and their confession is useless. If godliness is lacking, brethren, it doesn't matter what you can confess. It's useless. This is what James calls dead faith that cannot save. However, though, the end of, the end of what Paul says there in verse 16 should encourage you for this reason, brethren. If we do immerse ourselves in doctrine and we persist in watching over ourselves, our lives, and our doctrine, then we could rest assured that Paul's encouragement to, comes to us in this charge that ultimately, brethren, God's Word, God's teaching, God's doctrine is powerful. It's powerful in that it can save you and grow you, and sustain you. And that this Word, as you begin to grow in it, and mature in it, has the ability to ultimately keep you till the end. To save you, as He says. That if we would simply believe and receive what the Scriptures have for us, and we would give ourselves to it, and we would live in light in it, then we can rest assured, this Word will sustain me till the end. It will sustain me. Because brethren, the stakes in this matter are very high. Souls are at stake. Eternity's at stake. And so all we are called to simply do then is to receive this doctrine and hold fast to it. To be unwavering in it. To guard it. Live a life in accordance with it. Brethren, because in doing so, you have assurance here today. God will carry you to the end. So as we ask that question there one more time, why is doctrine important for the Christian life? Brethren, it's because doctrine and teaching is used and necessary to grow and mature you and to conform you into Christ. Which means then, we ought to take such good care in this church of guarding our life and our doctrine from error and falsehood. Because brethren, in doing so, listen, God promises to keep you till the end if you would simply hold on and persist in the doctrine that you've heard and in watching out for your life and this teaching. And so we can end with those words. Paul says, immerse yourself in these things, this doctrine. Pay close attention to your life in doctrine. In doing so, you will save both yourselves and your hearers. Let's pray.